Again, people don't like the idea that you have to prove anything. After all, I made an altar call, I believe in Messiah, why do I have to prove anything? Well, because you have to prove yourself worthy of eternity. You didn't have to prove yourself worthy of him dying for you. You weren't worthy. Nobody was. But eternity is what we prove ourselves worthy for. The blessing, the reward, is conditional. The ability to have the reward was given to you free and unconditionally. That's the salvation part that Yeshua provided. I've had several people over time you know, say to me, well, we really appreciate you thinking you're some sort of messianic Tony Robbins, but, but this is actually what the Torah's teaching is about. If you look at chapter four, it's talking about you have a problem with your pleasures that battle in your members. You desire and do not have, verse two. You murder and are jealous and are unable to obtain. You strive, etc. This is all because of a challenge internally with our emotions. And so it may sound like I'm getting into those areas, but it's absolutely 100% in your word. Okay, it's in your scripture. Because I've heard this quite a bit over the last seven or eight weeks, and yet there's nothing I've told you that's not right there. Okay, it's all right there, and we need to understand it, because it is the bigger problem than the mechanics. He says, and let it, the endurance, verse 4, have a perfect work so that you be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So the endurance is to the point of that you, would, you endure and you learn, you build up your growth of integrity, you get closer to perfection. In other words, it's not just uh, grinning and bearing it and man, this is tough. No, it's man, this is tough, but let me learn from it so I can get better at what I'm doing so I can go through this next time a lot easier or maybe even avoid it. So he says, let the endurance do what it's supposed to do. Don't fight it. Embrace what it's supposed to be teaching you. Let it have its perfect work so that you can be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Did you hear the subtle thing that was in there? Where you struggle, you lack something. So after saying, Count it joy in your trials, knowing that it proves your belief through endurance, let it have a perfect work so you lack nothing. He's going to make this point that the big piece here that you need is called wisdom. Wisdom. What is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. So if you lack wisdom, when you ask Yahweh, he says, ask Elohim for wisdom, Elohim's going to teach you to fear him as part of that. Don't just think all of a sudden he's, you're going to be like Solomon where he just gives you this blessing of wisdom. For most of the rest of the universe, it's life experience to teach you to fear Yahweh that brings wisdom. The fear of Yahweh teaching is very important for you for that. Fear of Yahweh is the beginning of understanding. It's the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom. The beginning of everything. So James is great in understanding the very simple battle of life, which is fear and doubt, battling against trust and belief. And he's saying, look, you can't do things in doubt. It doesn't work. So don't ask in a doubting manner. Don't ask without expecting fully in belief that it'll come. The thing is, you have to be careful that you have not preset the way it has to come. Because now you're limiting the way it can come. So when I ask for wisdom, I completely allow, well, first of all, I completely believe he'll give it to me, but I completely allow him to decide how I'm going to receive it. I have no input as to how he should do that. I just know I need wisdom in an area. And I say, Father, I need more wisdom in this area of my life. This goes back to Ephesians 4. You need a teacher. That doesn't mean you can't listen to others, but you need one that settles the debate. If there's more than one idea that you're listening to, if there's more than one way of approaching things, and you start to feel 
confused or unsure or having doubt as to what to do, you need to have the one that you go to and that's the way you're going to do it. That choice is up to you, who you do that with and how you, and you need to think about it really carefully because that's a big position to put anybody in. But you need that. And now, this is again more proof that the Ruach doesn't do what you were told it does. Because if you had the Ruach doing what you're told it does, I don't mean told by me, but like by mainstream Christians and stuff and other messianics, how, how the Ruach just teaches you everything and answers all your questions, you would never be confused. You would pray and you would have it all settled and the Ruach would answer all your questions. But it doesn't work that way, which is why you're confused, which is why you have these issues. You know, part of our life experience is that we can be interacting with almost anybody of any sort of personality and somehow still see them as a creature of the Creator and love them. Even though they may make us very uncomfortable. We had a gentleman come to the congregation over about 10 years ago and he had some serious psychological and mental health issues. He had a long history of sniffing glue and it had fried his brain pretty good. He was a good guy, and he was trying to work things through, but he was a little challenging, okay? And I had a person come to me after services when he was first there, and it was right before we had our meal together, and the person said, well, well why, why is that person here? And I looked him right in the face and said, that's why. I pointed at that. I said, because it's making you feel that way, and that needs to be fixed. I'm allowing this person here because that person is making you so uncomfortable with you're not being able to deal with someone who's that challenged. We can run into a place of doubt. This is what happens in every congregation and then little splits happen. And it happens over time on a regular enough basis because somebody will create some sort of level of doubt that this is the right place to be or this is the right teacher or about something. Or you may be friends with about a bunch of people in the congregation and somebody may create a little doubt about one of the people in the group of your little group of friends. This is the things that happen. And first of all, you wanna make sure you're not the person stirring the doubt. But then since you can't control that other than yourself, when other people are doing it, all you can control is your reaction to it. Okay, how do you react to that? Because a lot of you are watching and seeing what plays out. Wow, a lot of people have moved here to be a part of this, and then some have done that and then left. Then you may be wondering, I wonder if I made the right choice to move here. I have no idea. That's the only thing you can understand. But why are you letting what anybody else is experiencing affect you? This idea of being double-minded. Now we spent a bunch of time in parts 45, 6, 7, whatever, the last couple of parts talking about Philippians 2, 5, letting the mind of Messiah be in you. So what do you think double means how many? Two, so it's two-minded. So what do you think the other mind is that's the problem? You, <laughs> right? So we have the doubt because what we want or how we like it to be or how we see things doesn't match what he says and how he sees things and what he wants. And then we get tossed about. By tossed about, when you picture a boat on a rough, it gets tossed to the left, it tossed to the right, front and back, it's being bounced around. So that's what you do. You're trying to do what Yahweh said, then you're trying to do what you said. You're trying to do what Yahweh said, then you're trying to do what you said. You try to do what Yahweh said, you're bounced about. Make no mistake. This is a life journey process that he's talking about here. Enduring to the end. You know, Paul says that in other places. We know that John says in Revelation, those who will have endured to the end shall be saved. And we receive all these things. The endurance. So it's not something you can sit back and say, well, I've done what I need to do, I'm good. That was yesterday. That was 10 minutes ago. This is a forever, ongoing, now journey. Whatever now is, you need to be doing it now. In every now moment. The future hasn't happened, it may never come for you. You don't know when your time is done, and the past isn't here anymore. So you can't rest on that either. All you can do is do now. And you can learn to love each other and learn to love him correctly now. And you can find ways to express that love now.